what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's so much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Hello to my viewers out there. Welcome to On the Waterfront with Melinda. And today my guest is Tabitha Paul Moore. And uh, Tabitha is the president of the Rutland Area Branch of the NWACP. She and I also have served on the Planned Parenthood board together. I have known Tabitha for several years. And, um, and Tabitha, I wanna thank you for being on my show today. I want to talk uh, with you about the work that you're doing and about the racial justice movement in Vermont. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for being here, being my guest. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you again today. It's good to see you. Unfortunately, we can't be in person, but thank Air you. For hugs. Air hugs. <laughs> right. So first off, um, I understand that you are a sixth generation Vermonter, which I believe makes you a true Vermonter. Um, <laughs> And uh, I would, I'd like to talk a little bit about your family and how did your family arrive in Vermont? And, um, and tell me a little bit about your family. Right, so I am a sixth generation Vermonter, very proud of that. Um, my, my grandfather actually died in 2012 in the house in which he had been born in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1914. So um, lots, of, lots of history in that house. My family came to Vermont through Canada, um, over from Europe. That's my, my mom's side came over that way and settled in Rochester, in the hills of Rochester, Vermont. And that is where I spent my, the majority of my childhood playing log tag and fishing in the brooks and um, just a, a deep sense of pride on the McIntyre side to, to be part of Vermont's history. Well, sixth generation Vermonter, I mean, that's that goes back to to what the 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 early eighteen hundred. I mean, it goes back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Time. So how? Uh, which relatives were the first that arrived here? Where did they arrive in Vermont? Because right now, and and I think that for a long time, certainly in the town that I'm from in Huntington, mm -hmm. um, we have really studied and written books and articles about um, about the black settlers in our town and how mm -hmm. instrumental they were. So can you tell us a little bit about that history? Right, so the first thing you should know is that it's my, my mom's side, and my mom, I'm mixed race, so it's my mom's side is white. So it's my white family that came here. Um, they, so it's the McIntyres and the Simpsons um, that came down through um, Canada. Um, some of us are in Wilder, some settled in Wilder, Vermont, and then others continued to Rochester where um, they are farmers, like many people were back in the day. Um, my grandfather was a logger, had 100, over 100 acres that um, he lived off the land. And those are the values that were instilled in me as a child is that you live with the land and you live off the land. And you have some cows, he, um, he had beef cattle was the other way that uh, my family traditionally made, made money. My grandmother um, also taught piano lessons. Um, she was a big pianist and my grandfather was a fiddler. And so they spent a lot of their time uh, when they weren't out tending to the cows or um, hauling logs out um, and do you remember the beech nut factory over there? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. My grandfather, it was my grandfather's logs that um, laid the floors in the beech nut factory when it first started way, way back when, and it was before all those big roads existed. And they would tell us stories about, you know, hauling logs for weeks out there. Um, but that was, you know, we were definitely people of the land. Um, and my grandmother was a baker too. So she baked donuts for the local shops and um, the brush that would come from the logs, she would use that to make reeds. And that's how my family- What a great, uh, what a great story. Is your, are, your, are your parents still, still here? They must be still alive. Uh, well, my grandfather, my grandfather passed in 2012 and my mom inherited the house. She had five siblings and um, each of the siblings was, um, was gifted five acres of land right around the family homestead. So when I was growing up, I had a lot of my cousins around um, up through sixth grade when we left. Um, and um, so my mom inherited the farmhouse, which she's opened up to all of us in my generation for all of us to be able to go there and, um, and walk through. And my grandfather's fiddle, um, 
cannot leave the house or the property. I mean, it's just one of those things that became very important to us um, as a legacy, that legacy of music and um, in, in the land were just critical. So in, in the work that you do, um, Tabitha, you are, you're, um, you're, you, you're, you serve and you're an activist um, and you, it's, you know, a lot of the work that you do is a thankless job, um, standing up for the rights of others. What, who, who in your life do you, do you believe inspired you to take this road in life? Well, I think it comes from a few different places. What I learned from growing up, you know, poor on this farm and living off the land was that um, you need to value the earth. Um, so that's where my activist spirit around environmental justice kind of came was that, you know, we need to protect the earth and we need to work with it. Um, my family has an incredible work ethic, um, which has always been something for me that's important that you just keep working. It doesn't matter if the world is falling down around you, your job is to make sure that you can not just provide for your family, but provide for your community. Community was really important. Um, and I think a lot of it also came from um, what happened between my parents. My mom and dad met in the military um, in the mid seventies, which was only a decade after Loving versus Virginia passed, which was the law allowing people to marry interracially. And what happened was that they were, they had to pay extra for their marriage license um, because it was still, I mean, even just because it was illegal didn't mean that they were gonna make it easy. So they had to pay extra to get married. And um, I tell people sometimes, you know, my birth certificate is wrong and it's gonna be wrong the rest of my life because it has both of my parents back when they listed your parents' race as white. And that was just an automatic assumption. They saw my mother's white, so they assumed that, that my father was white, even though if you look at me, it's very clear that uh, both my parents are not white. And I remember in the late 90s, I was gonna be studying abroad and I wanted to make sure I would be able to get my documents. and. Um, I called up the state of California and I said, you know, my birth certificate's wrong. Or I called up um, uh, the, the, the visa office um, at the consulate and they said, you know, just get it fixed if you can. Um, call up the state of Vermont, er, of California, which is where my parents were stationed um, and see if they can fix that for you. And I called them and they said, oh yeah, we can absolutely fix that, but you need to, you need to come here with both of your parents to prove, and this is in the late 90s. That in order to fix a flaw that said that my father was white when he was black, that they wanted me to present him to the court. And I'm, and I'm like, no, and, my, and now my father's dead. So I, my, my birth certificate is just going to be wrong because of the ways that, you know, racism impacts our society. And uh, I never got to meet my grandparents because um, my grandmother passed away. She um, was apparently very ill and ambulances would not come into the side of town where, where she lived um, in Ohio at the time. So she passed away in her house because of racial segregation um, in, in, this, in the 50s and 60s. So um, knowing all of this and knowing what that would mean for me, um, I really kind of set out on a course um, to, to do something different, to, to try to get to my, know my roots in a different way. Like, I could go back generations in my, on my mom's side, but on my dad's side, I don't, I don't have that ability. And um, growing up in Vermont, as a, as a brown person, you just feel so invisible. Um, you're hyper visible and invisible at the same time. And so that really just created a fire within me. Um, and so I sought out to um, make this place better and different um, for people who don't fit into the mainstream. And you're doing that. Yeah, I had to leave. I, I'll tell you, I had to leave Vermont. I left in 1996. I was leaving Vermont. I was never coming back. I was never getting married and I was never having kids. So in 2009, I moved back with my now ex-husband and our then two children. We have three. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, no, Vermonters deserve something better. Um, whether that's sixth generation Vermonters or new Americans or people that are just moving here today, everybody deserves to be seen and valued and celebrated for what they bring to the table. Um, so you, you touched a little bit on life growing up in Vermont. You went to school here and you were raised here. Um, what was that like? And I know you say that you felt invisible and can you sort of segue into where you are today? Sure. The movement that you're seeing today in the state, because everybody thinks people think, oh, Vermont's so progressive and it's so liberal and and they, they're just, and, you, and I'm kind of like shaking my head and saying, you know what? Um, I like to think that. I mean, we all love Bernie Sanders and the progressive movement, but at the end of the day, 
we have a we have a dark side in this in this state that still is is alive and well. And I want you to share a little bit with me about that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vermont definitely has that mentality, or people have that image of Vermont as this bucolic, like, uh, very liberal place. But there's a difference between being liberal and being individualistic. And I believe that Vermont is much more on the individualistic side, which believes that everybody has a right to be themselves and to do what they want to do. As long as you're not messing with me, it doesn't matter. And Vermont falls much more into that category of great fences make great neighbors. Um, and, you know, there's a difference between that and believing that um, our greatest strength is our diversity and our community and our ability to come together and see each other. And I believe what we're seeing right now is kind of the, the, um, the clashing, or not clashing, but the, the rubbing together of those, of those two ideals. So growing up here, um, I, loved, I loved my little farm. I, you know, I am so grateful for the education and the ways that I came to know and love the earth because of that. Like I said, it really gives me a deep sense of environmental connection and justice. At the same time, what was missing was anything that felt remotely validating of my, of my blackness. And so what happened was like things in church, um, they would pass around, they passed around these little railroad hats for everybody to try on. And I had this, um, you know, I mean, back then I would have said unruly, but I just didn't know what to do with it. But I had this beautiful curls, it's a giant fro, and my mom didn't know what to do with it. And I put the hat on and it pops right off, of course, and everybody's laughing because they think it's this cute, funny moment. But for me as a young black girl developing my identity, it was just this moment where I realized I didn't, like, I don't fit in. I'm not like everyone else. And so there were all these reminders growing up that I'm not like everyone else, whether that was walking through the mall with friends and having um, security officers stop me um, for no reason, asking me to empty my pockets or um, trying to date and just realizing that, you know, when you're in high school and everybody's like, you know, who do you picture yourself with? And um, they the other person describes um, their ideal person or their children and none of them look like you, there's all of these ways that you get this message that, that you just don't fit in. Or when uh, Black History Month comes around <laughs> uh, and they start talking about um, you know, uh, slavery and everybody turns and looks at you. Um, I remember in the 80s, uh, that was the, the age of, tell us what the black people think. Um, and here I am, 11 years old, I don't even know what I think, let alone a whole race of people who are my people that I'm so disconnected from would potentially think. So there's a lot of pressure um, to perform, a lot of pressure to know more than I ever possibly could. Um, people would try to be helpful and loving, but often um, only uh, perpetuated stereotypes. Like I have really long fingers, but I'm five foot three, five foot four. And they'd be like, you know, they, they would see my, my long fingers like, oh, you're gonna play basketball. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm a cheerleader. What am I gonna do with a basketball? Um, or, you know, in, in PE class, I happened to like be able to do the, um, the standing long jump once. And my PE teacher was so proud of me. He's like, you know, you people have always been better at sports. And I was just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like, how do you deal with that as a child? And so many Vermont children uh, kind of face that. And so, you know, I, I left out with some particularly difficult experiences. Did you feel, did you feel special or did you feel... Uh, discriminated against. How did that? How did that make you feel? But right, the way I describe it here in Vermont, and it really depends on the adults around you and, and the messages that they give you. Um, I was naive enough when people would be like, "You can be anything. You can do whatever you want." I'd be like, "Yeah, I can." So I had that plus this hyper visibility and this invisibility thing going on at the same time. And there's a crossroads that you come to kind of in high school, in early in in your. Um, middle school, high school years where it's like, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this hyper visibility? Am I going to shrink into the background and just try to get along and just try to be, or am I going to use it as a, as a platform? Am I going to use it as a stage? Um, and I, and I was in acting. I loved acting. I was a cheerleader. I played soccer. I played softball, field hockey. I tried everything. I just had this, this desire to see the world. And so I decided I was going to use it as a stage. I decided that I was going to use my voice to do something with what I had. And um, I credit my, my acting teacher, um, Peter Marsh, to this day, I was actually talking to somebody about him. I'm like, I don't think he understands how when we're standing on that stage, we're firmly rooted in our place, and we are learning to project into the back of the theater, how much that grounded me 
um, in my identity. And I don't think my cheerleading coach knows how much her value of my strength and my voice um, played a role in me just surviving that system and being able to love myself uh, in, in ways that, you know, many black and brown kids don't get, especially here in Vermont. And so I carry, I've carried that with me and um, I turned that megaphone into a, um, a microphone and um, here I am. <laughs> into a voice for change. Yeah, I mean. And, I and, and a voice for, uh, for illuminating um, a mindset and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a reality that I think a lot of Vermonters just don't think about in our right. In I mean, world. white Vermonters don't think about these things. They don't typically have to. I was in a session recently with somebody and I was talking about um, seahorses and the fact that seahorses can either uh, reproduce asexually or they can um, change sexes depending on what is needed um, in their community and how we don't learn about that um, in high school and that there's a very re real reason we don't learn that gender is not as dichotomous as we like it to be. And um, my life is dedicated to illuminating those realities because those people exist. It's not just a seahorse, there's humans. You know, there are people like me who have contributed, you know, this country was built on our backs. Mm -hmm. And all we ever learn about is, oh, slavery was really bad and Martin Luther King did good things. And so to, to, to create dimension it is really important to me um, and to, to make it clear to Vermonters that we miss so much. <laughs> so how, so, so tell me in the, in the uh, what do we have, in the 12 minutes that we have left, how have, how have you done that? How have you taken all of this that makes you who you are? There's 27 different languages spoken at Burlington High School. We are an incredibly diverse city in Burlington. Mm -hmm. um, and you're down in Rutland. <laughs> and, I, and I don't know, you know, how that, you know, right. compares to Burlington, but to, I'd, li I'd love you to share to our, with our viewers, um, and I'm talking to Tabitha Bullmore, who is the the president of the of the branch, the Rutland branch of the NAACP. Um, and you have you have a long um, resume of all the extraordinary things that you've done. Um, and so I encourage everyone to Google you and read about your your accomplishments. But how how have you taken all of this and in this, in, in not just this defining moment, but really I want to focus about this defining moment right now in the history of our country that we're going through, which was such a wake up call. I mean, we all say, oh yeah, well, I marched for civil rights back and I you know, with Lyndon Johnson, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're like, and it's like, aren't we just the best ever? But at the end of the day, you know, we fell short in a big, in a, in a, in a big way. Right. And, and that's the lesson that I think so many of us are learning as we're reading and trying to study and get and actually get called out from time to time, which is totally uh, reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, so you are that voice right now, and I and you are being you are being we are people are turning to you <laughs> um, as a woman of color to say hey, and and so here you are again. You're in that place, but I think you're I think now you you know right. You're, you're an activist and you're changing minds and you're changing the way that Vermont looks at itself. And so how, tell us a little bit about that work and how you're feeling doing this work. Right, so I, I started the branch um, in, well, I started doing the work of the branch in 2016 because I knew that um, the Rutland area is not like Burlington. We don't have the same level of just diversity that's occurring that automatically, even visually, um, pushes people's boundaries, pushes white people's boundaries around thinking about and recognizing and making room for diversity, uh, racial diversity. So I knew that we had to create an organization in our area that could be a beacon and also um, be a mouthpiece for um, racial justice initiatives. So starting the branch um, was just the first step. And a lot of what we've been doing over the last few years, this first phase has just been kind of waking people up, which it has coincidentally or not coincidentally been at the same time that all of this national discourse and um, discord is being televised. It's always existed. And something I always tell people is that the NAACP is the nation's oldest civil rights organization. We've been around for um, 111, 112 years now. And we're still saying the same thing that they were when they started this back then because white folks still aren't getting it. So um, I feel compelled to have an education component where we are educating the community about what are the realities of what's happening right now, 
developing lenses so that people can get out there and start to call out and name and see what's going on. And then bringing people together as a community to say, how are we going to deal with this together? This isn't um, just on law enforcement to deal with. This is not the legislatures. This is our community and that we need to be the ones leading the conversation. So that's been a lot of, uh, of the work I've been doing. I also believe, like I said, in calling people in and working together. As much as I call people out, I'm also gonna call them in. Uh, so I work very closely with Vermont State Police and the Criminal Justice Training Council, um, other racial justice groups. For me, one of the most important things that we can do, growing up here, there were no racial justice organizations. And when I came back and started the branch and then all of a sudden all of these other entities are exploding, it made my heart so worn. And so I feel because we are the NAACP, we have a duty to um, um, uplift and protect and uh, walk alongside with, um, and, and they might feel the same about us too, other racial justice organizations and individuals doing this work to make sure that we all survive and that we all do this together. Uh, so a lot of my time is spent connecting with other organizations. Uh, up here you have uh, the Racial Justice Alliance um, that is doing the second commemoration of, so it's the 401st anniversary of the first African landing in Vermont. And like we, we help sponsor um, events that other- Can you say that again, Tab, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but say that again. It is the 401st anniversary of the first African landing in Vermont. And this is their second year doing this installment. So wherever we see people who are doing this great kind of work, we want to lift them up. We want to be under them. We want to support them. We want to have their back. If they want us to side, um, if they need the NAACP to, you know, to lead, we'll do that. So for me, that is really important that we're working together, um, the racial justice organizations and people who are interested in doing this work, that we're, that we're doing that together. We support a lot of legislative initiatives. Um, and like I said, we will work with the, governor, the, the racial equity task force that the governor just announced earlier uh, was because um, myself and Stefan Gillum, who is president of the Wyndham area branch, Wyndham County branch, people don't realize that there's two branches right now, um, got together with the governor and we're like, look, we need to address the fact that our definitions of bias and harassment still protect white supremacy and still protect white supremacist systems or supremacist systems and other identity areas. We need to change that. The governor listened. Um, so we're advocating on a lot of um, systemic levels because we know that as much as the individual interactions um, help build the movement, what makes the changes is what we do as systems. So talk to me a little bit. The legislature is taking up police reform um, and taking testimony. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what the NAACP of Rutland is providing uh, mm -hmm. to support uh, this, this, this movement in the, in the legislature to make some yeah. systemic changes in, in our policing. Right, so we, you know, um, the um, Act 54, um, the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system, we were, um, we were right there with the Racial Justice Alliance um, supporting that. We've supported a number of acts along the way, and right now, um, we met with Commissioner Sherling right as um, everything was happening in early June, and he said, you know, what, what do we need to focus on? And a few of us, you know, gave him some ideas and said, now you need to, to go to, you can't go to the, you can't go to the picnic empty handed, at least come and say, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? Um, and how are we going to build this together? Uh, so trying to help the commissioner um, do better um, is one thing that we've been doing. Um, Stefan, I believe, did just testify on the 6th um, about our position. The ACLU Justice for All and the NAACP jointly um, developed uh, a, a counter 10 point plan, not a counter 10 point plan, but an, uh, because the commissioner still hasn't um, done the work with the community that needed to be done, which is often what happens is that um, law enforcement will silo themselves uh, intentionally or unintentionally. I believe it was unintentional in this case, but I'm like, I don't care. You know, if you want us to come together to help you create a 10 point plan, then you better go to the community immediately with that and find out what the community wants. And unfortunately, I haven't done that yet. So the legislature took it up. So ACLU, Justice for All, NAACP, and I think we had like 11 other partners, uh, organizations sign on and say, these are the 10 points that we want you to focus on. Right. Let's figure that out. Uh, and I stand behind that and beside that. Um, so you'll be here. Actually, it's actually already come out in the news. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm testifying on Sunday, and those are the 10 points that I've been focusing on. Now, the ACLU Vermont just filed a lawsuit against Homeland Security for stopping people at the borders. Yep. You've been involved in that. I mean, I mean. We've yeah. Right. We have not been involved directly in the lawsuit, but we support what they are doing in Vermont. And whenever, like I said, 
whenever there's an action needed, whenever they want us to step up and testify, we certainly do. And I will call on them to do the same with like, hey, this is what you know we're focused on with the NAACP. Can you help us with that? Um, so um, yeah, those are some of the, the more systemic things. And then we're dealing with a lot of issues in Rutland Bennington region with um, individual acts of discrimination and harassment of um, people. And so really trying to get local police departments to understand their role in upholding white supremacy has been really difficult with Bennington. A um, little less difficult with Rutland, but not a whole lot more movement. Um, so we're continuing to push that on the local levels as well and trying to get people to engage politically. Um, if we don't come out, if it's just me and Stefan or me and the ACLU or you know, just Black Lives Matter saying it, um, it gives those in power reason to be like, well, there's not that many of you saying it. So part of what I'm trying to do now is encourage more of us to step up. We have to speak. We can't just suffer in silence. Well, um, are you reaching out to white folks to step up and speak out as well? I oh, mean, those are, oh, absolutely. Those are the first people we step okay. up to. Okay, so say, yeah. So what I want to share with my viewers is, look, we need to, we need to, we need to get on board here. We yeah. need to lean in, we need to step up, we need to scream out. So I need some information from you. Yes. One of the things that people can do is they can donate to your organization. Yes, NAACPRutland.org. Go to our website, again. NAACP Rutland, so that's N-A-A-C-P Rutland dot org. And right on the, on the page it says donate and become a member. And I encourage people to do both of those things. So, and if you're, if you're testifying or you need letters written or you need people to speak up in the legislature, if any of my viewers are interested in, in, in supporting this work, um, I suggest that you go to the website. What's, is there a phone number that people can call or would you prefer people access you through the website? It's better to go through the website than it is to call because um, sometimes it takes us a little bit to get back to phone calls unless there are um, emergencies where people so, are asking. NAACP Rutland Rutland.org. Dot org. And just I want to take a quick minute. I just Melinda really quickly to say we are the second largest branch in New England. So we have a lot of power. So we want more people to join us or join our sister branch in Wyndham County um, and um, help us keep growing so that when we put out those requests, say, hey, we need you to write letters, we need you to show up at this select board meeting, we need you to show up at the state house that people um, can spread that word really quickly. Because um, people are always asking, what can I do? Join us, donate, and then um, wait for the calls to action. So um, I, I, am, I am a member and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I need to get those emails because I wanna do that. So for my viewers, make sure I'm on the mailing list to get your emails because I wanna speak up. Yeah. And to my viewers, uh, you, can, you can become uh, a member of the NAACP Rutland uh, and donate because you need money to support yourselves and your organization and uh, stand up and step out, write letters, go talk to the legislature, be active. We all need to come into this together. And um, so, Tab so, so Tabitha, um, we have about 45 seconds here. Uh, what, what is the most important thing that, that we all can do to support the work that you're doing? Uh, join, join the membership. Join the membership read the minutes, show up at the meetings, and then take the actions that we encourage you to do. Um, support black and brown people, make sure it's not the black and brown people that have to keep having these conversations with white people because it's incredibly taxing. Send your black and brown people, friends, our way. Uh, we're trying, we have a number of initiatives that we're doing just for black and brown folks. So send them our way so we can um, take care of our people. And share, and share your information on people's social media. Absolutely. If you get something, share it. You know, let's let's get the power of the people behind this movement. Uh, let's make let's make the the systemic and important changes that need to happen that should have happened many 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 years ago. Four hundred years ago. Hundred years ago. That's right. And so it's now is the time, and it's way too late. So for all of my viewers out there, I I, I encourage you and ask you to uh, to join Tabitha in her work and to join um, this movement um, and change Vermont for the better. So. Tabitha. I do have just one more thing because okay. COVID-19 dispro disproportionately is affecting black and brown people here in Vermont as well. I encourage you, and I know Melinda does too, put on your mask, wear your mask. Thank so you. I, thank you for reminding me.
wear your mask. Uh, it's really critical. And Tabitha, um, I honor you. I love you. I am um, amazed by you. Thank you so much for your time. And, um, and to my viewers, thank you for joining us today. And be safe. And we will see you soon. Thank you, Tabitha. Thank you, Melinda.